Hi chums, this is Bert, me, and you're watching Pastory Time. Lime and mint cordial, non-alcoholic mojito. I, today, <laughs> today, I um, I was tagged really kindly by Sina from Beating Around the Books um, to do this tag. And it is, and the full title of the tag is the Mooks and Gripes Bucket List Book Tag. Um, Mooks and Gripes is a, a podcast, uh, like a book podcast hosted by someone called Paul and someone called Trevor. Um, I'm not, I've never listened to a podcast, so I don't really know uh, much about it, but you should probably, if you're a podcast person, they talk about books. I am a podcast person. Should oh. I check it out? Yes, might want to check that out. <laughs> um, so this is a tag, basically. It's not like lots of questions or anything. It's just a bucket list tag where you pick 10 books that are on your bucket list, 10 books that you'd like to read at some point in your lifetime. Um, yeah. Uh, so this is quite fun for me because it, it meant I could go through my old wish lists and um, I could go around the flat and pick the books that I've, I have keep meaning to read but not like as in like I, you know I need to read that this year but at some point in my life um, so I'm not a very ambitious reader I don't there's not like I don't want to read Moby Dick I'm not going to be reading um, what's that guy Infinite Jest David Foster Wallace. I have no intention. I'm happy to die with those unread. Um, <laughs> so so it, it, uh, these are very specific to my tastes and my life, I guess. Um, but these are the books that sort of keep cropping up as in the uh, back of my mind. I need to read that at some point before I die. Otherwise, my life wouldn't have been worth it. Let's go. Number one. Uh, I've written Richard Wagamese for this, uh, and really anything at all. He's just one of those authors that I really need to read at some point, because I know I'm going to love them. Um, the one I've written down specifically that um, I guess would be my first go-to is Medicine Walk. So that was um, from 2014. Um, Richard Wagamese is a Canadian First Nations author that I know a lot of you have read and loved. And I think he's uh, that kind of writer that... Um, I keep thinking of sort of Tom Spambauer, that kind of dangerous writing, that kind of writing that really sort of um, leaves you feeling uh, like you've been through something, like it takes a lot out of you emotionally. And so I think that's kind of put, keep sort of putting me off a little bit. I need to be in that place where I'm prepared to really go there and experience the novels. Um, uh, but Medicine Walk is um, about a sort of a teenage boy and his dying alcoholic father and, and it's basically their journey, their medicine walk um, to find a burial site for the dad um, and it's sort of through uh, like the woods or in a forest um, it's like to sort of try and find this spot that the dad remembers from his youth uh, so I love the sound of that and uh, I, need to, I need to read it at some point now at the end of the, this uh, top 10 uh, bucket list books um, I will ask you if you want to pick a book out of this top 10 for me to uh, read as like a, a challenge. So we can take one off the bucket list. Um, I think some of these are out of print, uh, you know, uh, but I might be able to find them like as, you know, sort of, sort of Kindle-y type things or on, if I can't then scrap it. But um, I'll try my best to find whichever one. Can I ask a question? Of course you can. Um, do you think like is dangerous writing still a thing? I think so, yeah. Yeah. Because I don't think it means a specific thing, does it? I think yeah. it's more about like what feels the most uncomfortable for you. Yeah. So like whilst the culture changes around you and whatever becomes like taboo or uncomfortable, that's sort of that's all. There's always going to be something that. Do you think Shuggy Bane was dangerous writing? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I don't know. I felt like Shuggy Bane was like sort of very realist so it's just like kind of grim realism right. which I don't think is the same thing I don't think he was sort of asking himself questions I think he was just sort of like telling a story yeah. as okay. frankly as possible so as okay. open-eyed as possible I think there's a difference okay. because I think dangerous writing can be like non 
non-realistic well, even. Well, I think of it, you know, like, Chuck Polnick as dangerous writing. Yeah, so it can go into, like, horror or fantasy or anything, really, yeah. can't it? Okay. Are we, are we on? It's my, it's my two cents. Very good. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Number two, Ask Agamemnon uh, by Jennifer Antoinette Hall. This is a book that I've always wanted to read because um, I'm a big fan of the film that was based on it. It was called Goodbye Gemini. It's early 70s sort of British uh, uh, sort of thriller, horror. Um, but whilst compiling this list, I looked into the author a bit and um, um, <laughs> she was born in 1939 in Bangor, North Wales. No way. Attended language school in Switzerland, secretarial school in London and art school in Shrewsbury. Wow. After working as a secretary and waitress for a year, Miss Hall spent several months painting and travelling. Well, it's interesting life, anyway. Like so, she sounds great. yeah. She wrote three books, from what I can tell, and I think this is the middle one. And so this is from mm, mid sixties, I think. It's about these two twins who are sort of you know blonde, blue eyed, perfect twins who are in London, and it's sort of that sort of swinging hedonistic London. And these two twins who are sort of almost sort of idyllic have this kind of uh, moments of terror throughout. So they keep having, I don't know, like a flashbacks or dreams. There's like some sort of darkness in these two twins. Um, and so I love that whole setting of um, Swing in London and sort of the underside of that, the sort of the dark side of that. I've seen this film, haven't I? I think you've seen this film. Yeah. yeah, it's a great film. And the book is supposed to be really, really good. Like I think the writing is quite experimental. It's narrated by a teddy bear. Uh, they're teddy bear um, so yeah it sounds really interesting it's out of print has been out of print for decades uh, but you know hopefully it'll be reprinted at some point and I can read it finally but yeah Ask Agamemnon um, so I think it's sort of the book it refers to some kind of sort of Greek tragedy kind of thing with that title uh, number three and I have a copy of this this is the Destinies of Darcy Dancer Gentleman by <laughs> J.P. Donlevy. Um, J.P. Donlevy is like just so dear to my heart to the point where I keep putting off reading his books. So I don't want to run out. So I discovered J.P. Donlevy in my 20s. Um, I read um, the uh, Be Beatitudes of Balthasar B, which is one of my all time favorite novels. It's like his writing is like unlike anyone else's writing. So he's an American-Irish writer. Um, he's best known for The Ginger Man. Uh, I mean, the Ginger Man is, you know, it's a great novel, but it's really problematic, I think. It's a great cover. It's a beautiful hardback. This is JP. When did you buy that? Um, or did you get it online? Years ago, yeah, online. Yeah. This is when I was just, sort, of, sort of trying to collect, he's like one of the few authors that I want to get all the hardbacks of. Um, uh, so yeah, he kind of writes in a sort of slapstick slash sad kind of way. It's quite saucy and sort of comedic in that the kind of the old fashioned way. But then there's a real kind of sort of tenderness and sadness and that sort of, um, sort of Irish melancholy to them as well. So it's this weird kind of Baroque kind of old fashioned mix. They're quite sort of flowery in their writing, but he's just such an amazing stylist. Like um, I think that in the closest that you would get now is someone like sort of Patrick DeWitt, who's kind of writing in that sort of same kind of sort of left field, slightly ironic sort of style. It's that mix of quite sort of verbiose kind of stuff with um, a bit of sort of quite earthy humour. Um, but I absolutely love him. And this, I think, is like a series. I think there's three books uh, with the Darcy Dancer character, who's a squire. I think he sort of is a youthful squire of this um, this big castle or house that's usually they're all about posh people um they're really odd Darcy Dancer gentlemen number four is a kind of another general author kind of thing but I have put a couple of book ideas down as well and um, which is basically anything at all by the author Entezake Shange um who is an African-American author um sort of predominantly known for his sort of 70s and 80s stuff so she's a uh playwright poet dancer feminist, activist. I was, I first sort of came across her when I was watching the um, Poetry in Motion documentary from 1982, which is kind of like a, a really good sort of documentary about the sort of poetry scene in America during 
kind of the early 80s and a lot of it is sort of that sort of post beat era kind of stuff so and that she kind of performed this multi sort of genre kind of poetry music dance kind of thing and it was great so uh yeah there's a new collection which is called wild beauty uh, which is new and selected poems so i think that would possibly be my first stop for her stuff because i think it's a good overview so she's best known for um, a play she wrote in the 70s called For Coloured Girls Who are, Who Have Considered Suicide When the Rainbow is Enough. I don't know anymore how to avoid my face wet with my tears because I had convinced myself coloured girls have no right to sorrow. And I lived and loved just that way and kept sorrow on the curb allegedly for you. But now I know I did it for myself because I could not stand it. I couldn't stand being sorry and coloured at the same time. It is so redundant in the modern world. There's also, so she wrote novels as well, and I've had a look to see which ones are available at the moment, and the one I'm most interested in is Sassafras, Cypress and Indigo, that's from 1982. And that's supposed to be really, really good, and I've heard sort of really good things about that one. Her thing was the liberation of the black body through dance, um, and kind of rewriting sort of uh, the language, you know, the sort of the patriarchal modes of writing and not mixing genres and... Um, and so, yeah, she sort of, you know, she really was an important part of the black arts movement of the 70s. And I think continues to, like, inform a lot of sort of current stuff. So I need to read her, basically. I'm not sure where to start, but um, either the poetry collection or the novel, I think, would be fantastic. Um, so, yeah, five I have. Well, actually, Sean has. And that is... Uh, 4321 by Paul Oster. So we both love Paul Oster and we both read uh, for Paul Oster for quite a long time. Uh, Sean introduced me to Paul Oster when we first met. So he's kind of one of our authors that we kind of are, you know, very fond of. But the size of this, uh, at the time it came out, intimidated me. That was like 2017, I think. And I think it was on the Booker mm -hmm. list at that point. It was. It's got it on the front, isn't it? Oh, look. Okay. Yeah, 2017 Booker. Um, Bishan read it, loved it. And, you know, Paul Oster's kind of generally writes quite small books. So this is definitely a new thing for him to have done. And uh, from what I can gather, Sean, maybe you can tell me this is kind of the, it's kind of like a panorama, like one person's store, whole life story, but told four times with slight changes. Yeah. Um, and he sort of lives through, you know, sort of the civil rights era and all these decades. Um, loosely based, I guess, on Paul Oster himself, and um, and as Paul Oster is kind of very um, focused on the idea of coincidence and sort of chance in life, I think he alters the odd little thing, and that might sort of lead to a slightly sort of different t telling of that life story, um, which I, it sounds fascinating to me. And I know that Paul Oster is an amazing writer, and he can pull it off. So, yeah, maybe I need to set myself like a, a target at some point to read this. I loved it, and, yeah. and and that year it was it was definitely in my top ten of books. Yeah. It might have been my favourite book of yeah. that year, and it's much easier to read. He's very easy to read, he isn't is, he? Yeah. So it's much easier to read than you might think, looking at the size of it. Yeah, and I really like, um, you know, I like those writers that that, that are trying to do something different as well. Yeah. So it, it almost like when I was reading like the Downdrift, it, there's like yeah. it it can be a bit boring, yeah. but there's something really clever going on and yeah. almost hypnotic about and it and they well. stay with you don't they because of that yeah. sort of thing of like they've sort of he's playing with he's always playing with sort of stories isn't he yeah. and endings as well yeah. and yeah that kind of thing yeah he's a fascinating writer um so yeah bucket list next up is a, a science fiction novel from 1977 called moonstar odyssey this is by david gerald david gerald is the guy that wrote um the episode Trouble with Tribbles uh, in the original Star Trek, which you all know because it's an absolute classic. Um, but Moonstar Odyssey is kind of a, a you know a very experimental uh, late seventies science fiction novel, which kind of challenges ideas uh, apparently challenges ideas of um, identity and gender, which was far ahead of its time um, in the seventies. It's been called a call for acceptance and love, no matter what gender. And this character approaches the uh, moment of the choice. So um, up until a certain age, um, all children are sort of androgynous. 
um, and sort of belong to no gender. And then they reach a point where they have to make the choice. And the choice um, on this world is either to be Reef or Dakar, which is basically, you know, like our versions of male, female. So I think what happens is the, the main character is unable to choose between these two choices and um, remains androgynous or remains, you know, um, non-binary, as we would say now. So, yeah, a quote from this book is, We sometimes forget that same-choice affection was rarely expressed in those times. And in fact, it was something that an unchosen felt she dare not admit within herself for fear of being shown as a deviant or worse, wrong chosen. Now that we know more of the wider spectrum of human choice, we can only pity those who felt they had to live in fear. I love that era of sci-fi. So I think I, I really like how sci-fi has almost like this sort of way in to sort of challenge uh, sort of I, our sort of societal ideas in a way that kind of almost infiltrates into people's minds in a sort of a, sort of a sneakier way because I think literary fiction you kind of expect it to do all this stuff and almost like people a lot of people that should be reading those ideas tend to avoid it whilst like genre fiction um, is kind of quite sneaky and sort of quite playful in the way that it sometimes you know challenges people's ideas of things so yeah Moonstar Odyssey number seven is a book that just like keeps coming up um, I keep hearing about it and I keep reading about it. It cropped up in lots of things that I read for, for so many years. And it's a book called The Technicians of the Sacred, which first came out in 68, but I think there has been sort of multiple reprints um, and like maybe expanded editions since then. But the subtitle is A Range of Poetries from Africa, America, Asia, Europe and Oceania. Um, and it was put on the LA Times uh, Book Review's 100 Most Recommended uh, American Books of the 20th Century. Um, and at the time it was sort of supposed to be like the first or like one of the, the, the major definitive um, overviews of you know what it called primitive and sort of ancient poetry. It says it's an extraordinary work of ethnopoetics and uh, anthology, um, rediscovering the archaic worlds of myth, vision and revelation, all the while connecting these worlds of mostly oral tradition to the poetic revolution of the word as epitomised by writers such as Ezra Pound, Gertrude Stein and Charles Olson. Um, technicians of the sat sacred present primitive and ancient poetries as the incantations they are loaded with power and very full of the magic that invests all good poetry so it's basically the source of all poetry these kind of spoken word um, pre-poetry poet poetry from all around the world and it's supposed to be like one of those books that are kind of you know goes back to the source and I, I feel like uh, someone that's interested in writing or someone that you know, loves poetry, I should at some point um, explore that. Um, I don't know if I'm ready for it quite yet, um, but I think I will at some point if I can sort of track it down. Is this out of print? I'm not sure if it's still in print okay. or not. I think it might still be in print. Okay, it sounds good. Yeah, uh, it's kind of one of those you know classic anthologies that um, it's kind of word of mouth anthologies that seems to be really important to a lot of writers. Uh, next up, number eight. This is Hard Rain Falling. It's by Don Carpenter. This is from 1966 and it's on the, it's been reissued on the New York Review Book Classics. Uh, and I've had this for a long time. And it's one of those books that I keep meaning to get round to. Um, but I think it's going to be again, because it may be quite hard going. So um, it's, yeah, described as kind of sort of crime, sort of hard boiled crime. Um, it's about an orphan teenager living off his wits in the flea bag hotels and seedy pool halls of Portland, Oregon in, in the 60s. That's and I think sort of later on in life, he's in San Francisco. Um, I'm in, I'm in, yeah, yeah. But I think there are sort of, you know, there's sort of lots of sort of um, trauma from like the Korean War in here. There's sort of, it's a prison novel, sort of reform school and alcoholism. And, I you know, back out. it sounds pretty gritty. <laughs> um, uh, I know Leo uh, read it from A Little Book Life um, and I think he really enjoyed it and it is one of those books that again just keeps coming up and I keep seeing it mentioned and yeah should I read this soon? Uh, John from Leafham says it's a particular favourite of mine his first novel Hard Rain Falling might be my candidate for one of the best prison novels in American literature yeah. um, it's, it's Vampire Academy on this yeah it should be. I hadn't thought of that. So, yeah. <laughs> I kind of know it really well from the film, though. So, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Number nine 
Angel Pavement by J.P. Priestley. Um, and this is kind of a 1930s novel, I think 1930 it came out, uh, about London really, told through various perspectives of people that work in this place called Twig and Dursingham, suppliers of veneers and inlays to the furniture trade. Um, so yeah, it's just kind of London seen through the eyes of these employees in this uh, this headquarters that um, is on number eight, um, uh, Angel Pavement in London. Nice. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, I think the size has sort of put me off a little bit. Um, but it's kind of everything that I like and it's just one of those novels that I've always meant to read and I sort of wanted to read it before it was even republished and um, I found this edition quite a long time ago and bought it and it's just sat on the it's a nice edition. Was, yeah. It was this lovely edition, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, it's a lost classic from the teeming world of depression era London. So uh, I know that um, Orwell reviewed it at the time and said it was, uh, well, he was quite scathing about it and said it, it was pretty bad. But he, he sort of said it was a, uh, it'd be an excellent holiday novel. <laughs> um, so it was very much, you know, mainstream fiction of the time. It wasn't sort of seen as highbrow at all. Um, and I like that. I, I think that's probably going to read better now than the highbrow stuff. Um, so yeah, Angel Pavements, sort of London in the 30s. Finally, um, Acid Temple Ball by Mary Sativa. Mary Sativa clearly is a made up name. I looked into it because, uh, you know, it's a drug connotation. And if you can see the cover, it's like an Olympia Press, uh, one of those Olympia Press books. It's a very sort of late 60s, early 70s kind of thing. Her real name was Sharon Rudal Pe Bexton. I can't read my writing, but... Um, or Dexter. <laughs> Pe Pexton. Do you could look at that quickly? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Peters. <laughs> you were nowhere near, Bob. Yeah. Sharon Rudal Peters, who went on to be a pioneer of underground feminist comics. So wow. this book came out in 1971, and it's a kind of a, you know, a psychedelic, erotic novel, which is sort of long out of print, really impossible to find. I think you can get like a Kindle or some, some download of it, hopefully. Um, but it's, it's, it's like an, it's an erotic novel. It's supposed to be great, though, really well written. And it's about a woman that has sex under various different drugs. Um, so I think she tries seven different uh, substances and describes... To go with each these... chakra. Who knows? <laughs> Possibly. Probably. Um, describes these sexual encounters. Um, and it's supposed to be very good. Um, and also, you know, I'm, uh, anything from that era, sort of psychedelics, uh, I'm in. Um, yeah, that's all I've found for that one. There's very little information about it. But um, it's been on my wish list for about 15 years. Um, so yeah, I'd like to read that. Um, that's my top 10 bucket list books. Um, they were so good. Thank you. So people have to vote, huh? Yeah, so the last thing on this tag is that, you know, if, if, if you want to vote for one for me to read, let's say by the end of the year. Vote by the end of the year? For me to read by the end of the year. <laughs> um, yeah, vote. Is that, does that sound like something I could do by the end of the year? I think so. Possibly not. Let's say like... No, by the end of the year. Come, but on. I don't come wanna, on, come on. Come on now, this. Come on. <laughs> by the end of the financial year, <laughs> which is April. April. You could vote for me to read something by the end of the financial year. <laughs> April 2022, please. Um, I would love to see what you uh, want me to read. Um, any of them are fair game. I will try and track them down, whatever. Um, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Sina, for tagging me. Uh, ciao.